Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous day on this beautiful collapsing planet. Here today in late August of 2019 here in the Catskill Mountains, but I think we're going to head a little bit west of where I am over to Minnesota, I think is where we're going today, where I have the great uh, long overdue pleasure and honor of speaking with journalist Jeremy Hance. And you guys might not even be aware of this, but you have probably, I have probably read more of Jeremy Hance's work than any other environmental journalist working the planet today because Jeremy is Rhett Butler's, I would call him Rhett Butler's right hand man over at Manga Bay. So if you have been listening to my Manga Bay roundup said that I do here every Friday, whether or not you're familiar uh, with Jeremy, you, you, you are, but let me just read his bio off his excellent website and then we're going to dive right into this conversation. Jeremy Hance has been working as a journalist since 2007. For six years, he served as a lead writer and editor at Manga Bay, one of the world's most popular and well-respected, and I will say the number one, in my opinion, on the planet, environmental websites. Currently, he remains a correspondent with Manga Bay while also keeping up a blog at The Guardian that covers stories from the front lines of conservation. As a freelance journalist, Jeremy has experience writing about wildlife, climate change, energy politics, animal behavior, indigenous people, and many other topics. In 2010, Manga Bay published a collection of Jerry, Jeremy's essays entitled Life is Good, conservation in an age of mass extinction and later on in the interview this is what this interview is going to center on is uh, Jeremy Hance has good naturedly uh, admitted to being somewhat of a uh, an apocaloptimist and we are going to get into this conversation about how Jeremy Hance of all people can still consider uh, life is good and, and have any sort of optimism about the state of the planet. But before we get into all that, Jeremy Hance, come on and say hello to the folks and we will dive right into this rollicking conversation. Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to have this conversation. All Thanks right. for having me on. <clears throat> okay, it, it, is, it is time for you <laughs> to be here. So before we get into... Uh, what what you what, well what you can offer up as good news here in the <laughs> end of the summer of 2019 uh let's dive into obviously the what has become one of the biggest stories on the planet as it should and the, this of course is the amazon rainforest in flames as uh, the Brazilian president Jair, I, I call the guy Bozo Naro, has just been unleashed uh, on the Amazon rainforest. So Jeremy, j just do a rip for a few minutes on, on your uh, opinion of, of what is really going on in the Amazon <clears throat> jungle with Jair or Bozo Naro as you understand it. Sure. I mean, so uh, Bolsonaro was elected uh, last fall, if I remember correctly. Um, he was elected on a campaign that was really sort of a, a, a deep right wing, somewhat populist. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Brazil has dealt with a number of corruption scandals over the last couple of decades. And so he was sort of that that kind of that I'll come in and I'm going to do things differently and I'm going to be this right wing populist. And he had said some very, uh, very, I guess we could say nicely divisive, but really hateful things <laughs> about gay people, about indigenous people. He has a whole long record of this um, about women, uh, but he still was able to win the election. Uh, and, and at the same time, he was running on a platform that was really what I would call pro forest destruction. 
uh, he wants to basically he he, he works with the uh, ruralista bloc in in Brazil, which is a bloc that believes that really Brazil should focus all of its energies uh, on allowing farmers, big farmers especially, but medium sized to uh, to kind of just run things the way they would like to. You know, not to be regulated when it comes to uh, deforesting the Amazon, not to be regulated on pesticides, not to be regulated on on various ecological issues uh, that come with industrial farming everywhere around the world. So he he basically ran as you know as one of them. Now the interesting thing is that the majority, you know, when you look at polls, the majority of Brazilians want to protect the Amazon. Um, they see it, uh, I, I think, very rightly as a a a natural resource <laughs> gift of mana that that um is really you know the world's other than maybe the entire oceans if you want to call that one ecosystem i think the amazon is probably the world's greatest ecosystem um so you know they elected him despite that but you know as as we know in america and beyond usually environmental concerns aren't number one so but what is what has happened this is the context of what's going on right now so every year in the amazon as there as it is in many tropical countries there is what's basically a burning season, where farmers will will deforest uh, ahead of time. They'll knock down trees and such, and then they'll burn everything. This happens in Indonesia. This happens in Brazil. This happens. This is happening in the Congo right now. This happens everywhere. Uh, the Amazon has burning season every year. There are tens of thousands of fires there every year. Uh, what is amazing about this one, honestly, is that it's getting any attention. And that is, to me, as a journalist, is amazing because I tend to write these articles that know that don't get a lot of attention, that don't make it into mainstream media, that I very feel very passionately about and feel like it, they they matter. And then all of a sudden, this, these Amazon rainforests that do happen every year are getting this explosive attention, and it's amazing. Now, the the fires are uh, at this point they are worse. About I think it's about 82 percent more fires than there were last year. But if you look at sort of the the last two decades, they're they're within about what's normal of the last two decades. But Brazil had been doing a really good job of stopping deforestation, of lessening fires, of mitigating this in the last 15 years. And what what concern of environmentalists uh, and in indigenous peoples has been is that Bolsonaro is going to change all that. So he comes in, and all of a sudden, all that good progress that's been made, all this hard work, blood, sweat, and tears of of, of the government of Brazil, of indigenous peoples, and of conservationists is just going to be lost as he comes in. And I think for whatever reason, this fire season, which I think should be getting, I think the fire season should be getting this much attention every year, yeah. but for whatever reason, this one has really exploded onto the scene. And, you know, we have the French <laughs> president talking about it. Uh, the e, you know, uh, members of the EU are threatening trade issues, uh, canceling a trade agreement over this. Uh, it, it's incredible to watch as a journalist to actually see the environment become one of the biggest stories on the planet because it almost invariably never is. So how much of this 82 uh, percent rise in the number of fires over last year and I think the 88 percent increase in just pure deforestation recorded by Brazil's own space agency uh, last month, how much of this can be attributed to uh, Bolsonaro? Would I'm sure you know what I'm asking here. What what percentage yeah. of that 88 percent or 82 sure. percent blame does does he need to take? I think all of it. <laughs> I mean, I think he came in signaling that his entire platform, when it came to the Amazon, was to develop the Amazon. Uh, that means more roads, that means more hydro projects, that means more energy, that means more mining, that means, you know. But that also means, you know, wink, wink, cut it down. He doesn't care. He, he doesn't care about the Amazon. He's, he's, he doesn't, and, and, and to, 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 to make this tragedy far worse in many ways, is he has basically, I would call, a racial hatred uh, of indigenous people. Um, he has, uh, in the past, he, he once bemoaned that the Brazilian cavalry weren't as effective at genocide as the um, American cavalry was when it came to the Indians. Um, so this is not a person that really cares about the Amazon or the indigenous people. And we have seen an uptick in violence and murders against indigenous people since his election. Basically his election, I think, you know, gave, gave a, a, a green light to 
for farmers. And farmers are on the record. There's been some really good reporting that has shown that farmers have said, like, you know, yeah, we cut down more forests this year because we're, we want to show Bolsonaro that we're getting ready to go back to work kind of a thing, you know. So this, I think, I think pretty much all, you know, I would not hazard to say. I mean, it, 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 weather-wise, it's a pretty normal year in Brazil. It's not particularly dry compared to normal. Um, so I would, I would hazard to say that the rise in fires and the rise in deforestation can pretty much be laid at his feet. Um, and I, I, you know, my concern is that that's going to just get in, uh, worse as his term goes on. But the one, you know, bright side of this is all of a sudden all this world attention is 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 on him, and, and he clearly is feeling the pressure, which is an interesting spectacle to watch. Yes, an interesting spectacle uh, that Bozo Naro sending in the Brazilian military to fight the very fires that, as you say, and I agree with you 100%, he, he's responsible for starting these fires, and now he is sending in the military, which, which obviously is just a grandstanding uh, photo op. Uh, but... All you can do is keep your sick, twisted sense of humor. But so, do you? You you don't. Do you <laughs> think that any of this international pressure? I guess even the Pope I hear has now weighed in. Uh, is any of this international pressure going to make this guy uh, back off at all, or is it just going to be more underground and hypocritical? Sure. I think we have to wait to see. Um, I, I think, you know, you shine a light on, I mean, Bolsonaro is basically an autocrat, you know, you shine a light on that. And, and, and he clearly, his whole, his whole message is about the economy. He clearly is feeling the pressure. And I think that's what he's, he's not, you know, he's no longer running around saying that the NGO started this fire. He's no longer running around trying to, you know, claim re ludicrous uh, conspiracy theories or whatever about what's going on. He is he's basically now now he's on record, like complimenting the very laws that he wants to tear up. So, you know, he's clearly feeling the pressure. The, the question from my end is going to be what's what's the next steps? Um, is the international community actually going to hold firm and continue to keep an eye on this, which I'm doubtful they will. But, you know, maybe <laughs> um, are you know, are they going to be able to keep pressure on it? Or is he going to be able to, like you say, kind of go underground and keep doing the things he's doing? My hunch is, is that will probably be somewhat the latter, but all this pressure means that he's going to have to change his tactics and he's going to have to move a little more slowly and a little more, you know, slightly. And that that might have some good impact. We'll just have to kind of wait and see. But he knows that the eyes of the world are on him now. And that's not a great place to be when you're, you know, burning down the world's most important ecosystem. Yeah, just so just one more question on this because I have a lot to yeah. talk about with you. So, what what is your opinion on the argument uh, that Brazil, uh, you know, is claiming this is Brazil? It's nobody else's business because you are from the <laughs> United States and and you have Donald Trump doing the same thing. You know that that you have no. Yeah authority that nobody outside of Brazil, because they live in a country that's not perfect uh, either, they have no right to weigh in on this argument that this is nobody's business except Brazil's. What is, how do you respond to that claim from Brazilians who might say that? I mean, uh, I, that, that claim stems from a sense of, of nationalism. And I, I, you know, on the one hand, yeah, I get it logically, you can make that claim fine. But I think uh, when you talk about the world's ecological systems, it, it, that, that claim is just silly. Uh, the Amazon rainforest provides, um, you know, uh, massive carbon sequestration. Uh, it is the most biodiverse place on the planet. There are probably billions of, well, there are billions of life forms that live there. There are undiscovered medicines. It's a, it's a vast, I mean, I, I visited, I visited several times and it's one of my, probably my favorite place to visit on the planet. Um, it, it's just incredible. And, and it, and it provides, you know, a massive amount of fresh water. It, the idea that, that these large systems belong to only one country or only one people, uh, and that is Bolsonaro's argument, right, is that everyone yeah. else should stay out of it, is, is a bit ludicrous when you see that these are global systems. And, and knowing what we know about ecology today, knowing what we know about the climate system, about the water system, 
about all these things and knowing that the world is now run on a global economic system. You know, and so, uh, you know, these things matter to everybody. I would also point out, though, that the vast majority of Brazilians don't want the Amazon destroyed. So there is that. Uh, the Amazon, the both, you know, a number of the areas in Brazil, these are protected areas that have been set aside by Brazilian, by Brazil's own government as protected that are now being cut down and deforested and set on fire. There are indigenous areas that are protected as indigenous land that are being cut down, deforested, and set on fire. So uh, I, I think that, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a silly argument when uh, knowing the world that we live in today. Um, the oceans don't belong to any one nation. The rainforests of the world don't belong to any one nation. The forests of the world, these are all systems that if we're going to have any chance of any future world that is at all, you know, uh, conducive to uh, society, then, you know, we have to start thinking about these things in different ways. There you go. My, my response is, whenever I hear this, is anybody on the planet who wants to join in the chorus of howls of protests about Donald Trump's environmental policies, I invite anyone in Brazil, Russia, China to talk all the trash about the United States' environmental policies, and they can. I mean, this, you know, sure. anyway. But there is... Yeah, no, I, I would, I welcome all the criticism of, of, our, of our current government and past governments. All of it. Come on, give it to me. I'm fine with that too. Exactly. You know, I think I think as 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 human beings, we should be uh, able to criticize. I mean, with sound arguments, other countries. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I understand that there's a lot of uh, you know you see this in, in well, I've been to Southeast Asia a lot, and there's a lot of well, you can't criticize us because you cut down your forests. But you know, we also we know better now. Um, uh, the world is different now. There are seven point whatever billion of us. It's it's not the 19th century anymore, and we have a lot more knowledge about what these systems actually mean. Um, so yeah, but also yeah, bring on the criticism of my government. That's totally fine. Okay. All right. We're going to change gears now since we 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 have to shift gears kind of radically because there's. I want to get into the whole uh, subject of apocalyptimism, before, but I want to touch briefly on, uh, you did an excellent four-part series in Manga Bay that I've been recommending people read for uh, the, the past couple of months, and, and on the insect apocalypse, just give us a Give it, give us a five minutes uh, roundup on where we are in the insect apocalypse uh, on this planet. How much of a threat do you think this is, and is it going to get worse before it gets better? And just just wrap that sure. up, and people can find more about <laughs> this on your website. Yeah. Check out check out the four part series. Wrapping it up in five minutes is challenging. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Sure, I can do that. So what the series was is, you know, we have had these research. Uh, the, the first research really came out of Germany a couple of years ago that found that winged insects had, had just plummeted. Uh, in, and, and when I'm talking about plummeted, I'm talking about abundance of insects. Uh, and that really hit the news, was really an interesting, terrifying study. And they had, they had, the abundance had fallen in these that were in protected areas um, over several decades. So what we did, and then there was a study uh, out of Puerto Rico that showed uh, insect populations crashing in a protected area in, in, in tropical forests. Yeah, I have an inter uh, I'm sorry. That, well, do you remember the name of that? I interviewed the man who led that study in Puerto Rico. It's an excellent, I mean, now I'm not uh, having a, What's his name? Bradford Lister, is that who you're Yeah, yeah, about? Brad Lister. So, okay, it's yeah. so I just want to let people know that you can find my my full interview with Brad Lister about that study on Collapse Chronicles. But anyway, sorry sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah. keep, keep, no, that's keep on. perfect. No, yeah. I'm I'm glad to hear that you interviewed him. Um, so there was that study, and then there have been a number of other similar uh, studies that looked more at like I mean, there's we have we have more research on say like butterflies than we do on a lot of other insects. So there have been some other studies that sort of again kind of complemented this. And basically, what an, an editor uh, and I decided to do was to, to look around the world and say, okay, uh, let's just reach out to a bunch of entomologists around the world and see what they think about this. Because what we really have now is only a few studies showing large-scale insect decline. Um, but it, it, there are studies that are 
concerning enough that we thought, let's, let's take a look. And so I interviewed, oh man, a lot of people. I think it was over two dozen people, over 25 people on, you know, on six different continents over several months to just find out what, what the thought process was. And I, I guess the consensus, I mean, there's a lot of diversity. This is the thing is this is relatively new. Um, a lot of scientists are just starting to kind of look into this. But there was, I would say, a, a relatively secure consensus that, yes, insect populations uh, in abundance are dropping. Um, diversity is potentially also declining, especially in certain areas. Uh, the rate of drop is, is debatable. You know, we don't really know. Uh, is it happening everywhere? Uh, we don't really know. It's certainly happening in Europe where we have the best data. It's more than likely happening in the U.S. where we have some data. The rest of the world is pretty blank, but anecdotally, uh, yeah, it's probably happening in other parts of the world. It is probably happening at least in portions of the tropics, um, but there are some other studies that show, you know, stability um, and 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 some species. So so just to get a, a bigger framework, this 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 insect apocalypse or an insect mass extinction, this doesn't mean that insects are going to suddenly vanish from the world. You know, insects have been around for hundreds of millions of years. They are one of the most successful groups of animals ever. They're, they are the most diverse group of species on the planet. Uh, they are going to survive. They will outsurvive us. They will outsurvive pretty much anything else. But what we're talking about is a drop in abundance and a drop in diversity. And what that could mean is a, a drop basically in ecosystem health. Uh, you know, insects do everything for us in terms of uh, pollination, in terms of soil health, which is a huge issue right now. And they, they, they underpin the entire eco, land-based ecosystems. You know, so many animals depend on insects as prey. Uh, you know, when the insects drop, what happens to all the birds that depend on, that are insect-eating birds? You know, so... Uh, and the lizards and that, and then so and so and so and so on and forth, so forth. So, you know, what we found was, yes, there was probably large scale decline. Uh, yes, it's, it's potential. It's at least in certain areas. Uh, it's probably, there was some, you know, there's, I, I guess there are sort of a number of the same, it's the same sort of causes as you see everywhere. It's, it's industrialized farming, uh, it's deforestation, it's climate change. Um, it's pesticides and, you know, depending on which scientists I would talk to, they would stress maybe a different element of that, depending on where in the world they work, what they're seeing, you know, some were really thought that climate change, at least in the tropics was playing a major role, uh, in Europe, they think it's more habitat loss, uh, industrialized agriculture and pesticides, but you know, it just, so we're really at the beginning of trying to understand this, but it was a really interesting series and, uh, you know, a dark series in many ways to write, but it was also fascinating to sort of see what these scientists thought. And not all of them agreed that there was a total, you know, that we are looking at a collapse. Some of them said, we just don't know yet. We need more information. That's, that's the bottom line more and more that nobody knows, you know, try, trying to predict uh, what's coming down the pike and, the 21st century. So, so Jeremy Hans, we're we're now going to uh, start a tipping point here uh, in this in, in this conversation. We could go on with the the doom and gloom from Bozo Naro to the insect apocalypse uh, to the collapsing sea ice. We could sit here and go through the usual list of. Uh, suspects that you do every week in in Manga Bay. Yeah. Uh, but let's segue into the next section. I want you to talk about uh, this, uh, this from bottleneck to breakthrough uh, study or article. Uh, anyway, I, I have to admit, guys, I, I was all set to, and I'm going to be honest here, Jeremy, I just mm -hmm. about took your article on from bottleneck to breakthrough, particularly on that other channel that I don't talk about here on Collapse Chronicles, and pretty much hold it up, you know, just taking a lot of cheap shots. 
but out of respect for sure. you and Mong, if, if it had been anybody but you or Manga Bay who had <laughs> printed this, and I have so much respect for you and Rhett, I wasn't going, going to, uh, sure. you know, hold you up to, to a, a public thrashing in the Doomosphere. So I, I <laughs> believe it or not, Jeremy, I hit the edit button as hard as it was for uh. me. But I want you to tell the folks uh, about the From Bottleneck to Breakthrough, what that was all about, A, yeah. and B, do you actually believe uh, what this paper was about, and then we're going to come back with a further discussion okay. about apocalyptimism. Bottleneck to Breakthrough, what well, was that all about? Yeah, let's explain bottleneck to breakthrough because I think that it's it's an interesting idea, and then yeah, we can get into whether or not I mean there's yeah whether or not I, I, I how much I buy it, how much I don't. You know? um, so bottleneck to breakthrough is this really is an interesting idea. I read this paper a while back, and I was just intrigued by it. Um, it's by some really uh, very whip smart uh, people at Wildlife Conservation Society, and I, I find Wildlife Conservation Society to be one of the best large conservation groups. I think there's a, a lot of really good small, medium-sized conservation groups, but Wildlife Conservation Society, I think, is one of the better big ones. Um, and I was just, I was intrigued by it. It's an intriguing idea. Uh, it's seductive. I will say that. Um, so basically, their, their theory, uh, what they were putting forth, um, is that as nations develop, um, they go through what's basically called the bottleneck, right? Which is the bottleneck is when a nation is sort of the population is largely increasing. Um, there's tons of workers, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, my God, we need to develop and we need to build the economy like crazy. And they just start ravaging nature with, you know, with just everything that can, you know, every kind of pro uh, proposed and every kind of thing is done. And, you know, and they basically build the infrastructure of what you would may, might think of as a sort of a modern industrialized American type or European type uh, nation. And, you know, uh, they destroy a lot of nature. And then all of a sudden this, there comes sort of this, this reckoning or awakening where the population, first of all, the fertility starts to decline, which we've seen all over the world except for uh, in parts of sort of more Central Asia and, and other countries. But most of the world has now seen a massive fertility decline. So that happens. Um, education improves. You know, the, the standard of life improves. And then all of a sudden people start saying, oh, this nature thing, this environment thing, we should really start to take better care of this because our cities are, you know, filled with pollution and our rivers are on fire and our parks are just, you know, disrepair and our, you know, all this kind of stuff. And uh, so they start to switch. And basically what, what these people, uh, these researchers argued is that through this process, you have an increase in urbanization. So you have Basically, people start to leave rural areas and go into more increased uh, in urban areas. Uh, like I said, fertility declines quite rapidly. Uh, the population starts to uh, slow down. And then eventually, like as we've seen in places like Japan, uh, Portugal, very, a lot of European countries now are going through this where the population literally stabilizes and then starts to fall. Um, and basically, over time, the environment you know, again, this is their argument, the environment, the local environment, you know, starts to improve, there's more being done for the environment, and things start to get better, again, their, their argument, um, and, you know, they, what they kind of did is they sort of looked at this on, you know, on, on sort of a national, localized scale, and then they thought, you know, they took a thought experiment as what could this look like in 100, 200 years, you know, right now we have a population, you know, going on to 8 billion Eventually, you know, according to the UN, that population is going to stabilize. It's going to stop, and then it will start to fall more than likely. Um, you know, so in 200 years, could we have a population of let's say three billion, living in a relatively, I guess you would call it today under the sort of the word that's used way too often, but sustainable way. You know, where there's a lot more nature, all this kind of stuff. So. What I was just, you know, I read this article and I was like, this is really interesting. And I know that, you know, so I did an interview with these, uh, with two of the, the lead authors, um, super smart guys, you know, know their stuff, have been on the ground all around the world. Um, these are really, so yeah, I thought this is going to make a fascinating article. So I wrote up this article and indeed I thought, you know, it's fascinating. Uh, it's a really, it's a really nice idea. Um, I think there is some validity to it. 
Uh, but how much validity I think is debatable. I mean, so, so let me explain sort of as a journalist, you know, it's not like I'm, I get, I get tossed an assignment or I get tossed, uh, 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 yeah, an assignment or, or a paper to write about. My job is not to sit there and, and give my point of view. It's not, it's not to interject myself most of the time, you know, sometimes as a journalist, you get to write more of an analysis piece or, and you know, an opinion piece. Sure. You can interject yourself. My job is really to present the scientist's argument uh, in a hopefully a way that's enjoyable to read and that's enlightening and that gives the facts and then to let the audience sort of decide what they want. And if people want to say this, this article or this idea is complete crap, that's totally fine. Uh, if they want to read it and they find themselves agreeing with parts of it, you know, interesting, great. What do we do then? You know, um, so that's my job. Um, I will say I was intrigued by the idea for sure. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an intriguing argument. I think for all of us who live in the current state, it, it's often hard to see the sweep of history. Um, the world changes and, you know, it, it's impossible to know what the world is going to look like in 200 years. I think there's a lot of, you can look at the evidence on the ground and you can make a lot of predictions, but they're ultimately predictions. Um, and so, yeah, it was an intriguing idea. I let myself get swept up in it for a couple of days. I wrote the article, I published it, and then I moved on to something else because that's what you do as a journalist. You know, you don't, um, you, you don't sort of get yourself trapped too much because yeah. you're constantly working on new issues and stuff. So, you know, I, I can say I was intrigued by the idea and, and I found it really interesting and I found it a pleasure to write about it, and I loved talking to the scientists. Whether or not I agree with it 100%, I mean, no, probably not a hundred percent. I think it's it's. Well, what parts? I think it's an interesting idea. What, what parts do you agree with? Okay, well, well, where, where I would agree with is I do I do see uh, one. I think the most intriguing part for me, and this might be different than the scientists. And again, this is coming. You know, we're having a personal one-on-one -on -one yeah, conversation, yeah. and journalists aren't usually used to talking about our own opinions and selves. So I'm going to try and turn that on. But what I what I found most intriguing was the population argument. You know, we see fertility rates crashing throughout the world, um, except for, again, in sub-Saharan Africa, which is what's kind of keeping our current population trajectory uh, as still rising for a while. But eventually there is going to become a time, uh, if, if these trends hold out, where the population will stabilize and then it will begin to fall. Uh, and there's probably not much any politician's going to be able to do about that. So I just want to make sure you, you, yeah, go ahead. You, you think the decline in fertility rates and population is a good thing for the planet? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably the best thing that's going on. <laughs> it might be the only chance we got. Um, no, I do think it's, I do think it's definitely a good thing for the planet. Uh, for sure. Uh, you know, uh, because one of the, I, I think I think there's 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 you know our environmental issues are brought on by I think first and foremost really stupid politics, um, by bad decision making and short term thinking, but it's also a combination of uh, we have seven plus billion of us super predator consumers uh, added on to the fact that we have a a consumeristic society across much of the planet where people just you know buy buy buy. Um, and materialism is sort of the the world view of the day. Um, you combine those things together, and I think that's what's driving a lot of the uh, the issues that we're seeing today, from the oceans to the climate. Um, you know, if we had two billion, three billion people on the planet, it would be a lot easier to fix any of these problems. Uh, that would solve a number of issues um, it, and and make things a lot. Uh, pleasanter, I guess I would say. Now that's going to take a few hundred years if that happens at all, and who knows if it will. Um, but that was one thing that I found very intriguing about their argument is that, you know, with these, uh, you know, women deciding that they do not want eight children, you know, uh, families deciding that they want one child or two children, you know, that, 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 the problem is, is, is where, where I saw the difficulty in this argument, especially was the, the argument of climate change. Because with the climate changing at the pace it's changing and it's already built into the system, you know, uh, the population is not going to shrink fast enough to really matter for that. So, um, you know, I, I think that's 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 one of the wrenches that's thrown into this argument. But um, 
Yeah, I think I think for sure to get back to your original question that that less people is going to be better for the environment. Okay, now now Jeremy, again, if, if what I'm getting ready to ask start start stepping on your toes, tell me tell me to back off. Uh, obviously, people are going to find out. I, I didn't read this in your bio. You have you and your wife have chosen to be parents. Yeah. You have a yeah, yeah. you have a daughter. Are are you going to have more children? And the bigger question sure. is just I I remember Bill Moyers asking uh Chris Hedges the same question that if you knowing what you know about where this planet is heading and what you do for a living Basically, what went in your in your wife's decision to to have children? Sure. Um, so yeah, we do have one daughter. She is eight. She's awesome. Uh, she totally makes life a gift. Uh, I don't think we're gonna have any more at this point. That's that seems to be you know there was always that kind of that debate that happens as we're you know we're getting a little older and and I and I think looking obviously at the the situation around the world. Yeah, I think I think we'll probably be sticking with one. We both came from bigger families, though, and there's always sort of that thing of like, yeah. you know, do you want to, si you know, do we want to do a sibling thing? And, you know, there's all those, those, but those are very personal questions for people, right? Like, when you start talking about individuals and how many children they're going to have, I think that, that that's where there's a lot of, like, concern about talking about population is because it starts to enter this really personal space between, you know, families. And, and, and so I think that the, it can add those difficulties. But, um, why did we decide to have a child? Well, let's see. So, you know, I started this whole gig when I was 27 or so. I started writing about the environment. Uh, so how and old my are daughter you was now? born. Uh, my daughter was born three years later. And, you know, I, I think we just, that was what we wanted. You know, we wanted to have a child. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it, and it's been the adventure of my life. Uh, and I, you know, don't regret it at all. Is it scary in this time and day to have a kid? Yeah. Uh, but we've been also very candid with her about climate change, about mass extinction. She knows probably way more than she should about these things at this age. Um, but I feel like that's my way to prepare her for the world that she's going to inherit. Um, uh, yeah. Do I feel like scared about, you know, obviously, I mean, I will say the one thing, you know, when we talk about sort of optimism, and I don't know if I want to use the word, I wouldn't call myself an optimist so much as maybe like I do have some hope because I think it's a survival mechanism that like you kind of, in this job, you got to have some hope or what's the point? <laughs> um, you know, what, why, why would I not just, I mean, it's not easy being a journalist. It's even harder being a freelance journalist and it's even harder being an environmental freelance journalist, you know. Uh, why would I do this job if I didn't believe that we couldn't change uh, to some extent? Do I think it's likely? I don't know. You know, depends on the day. Probably not. But, you know, that sliver of hope keeps you kind of going. And I think when you do have a child, uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm hopeful is because I have to be because I have an eight-year-old. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, you, 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 you. Uh, that is that is sort of a built-in psychological part of this, um, but I also, I, yeah. Let's let's stop there. I, I'm curious. You know, let's let's see where the next thing goes. Okay, uh, that that was that was a that was a good answer certainly. But okay, we were still we we were talking about from bottleneck to breakthrough. So obviously that's one thing yeah. appealed to you. I want you to comment that this is just. Personally, I have to admit I am a little bit conflicted on this whole urbanization, this this move toward more urbanization. I can see both sides. I am a big defender of and supporter of rewilding and and leaving yeah. more and more of the landscape to our fellow earthlings. So on one hand, particularly like I've spent a lot of time traveling in Latin America and 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 I, I, uh, on one hand, I cheer on people moving to the big cities and leaving the countryside, you know, left to recover. But then there's, there's plenty of research out there, Jeremy, you know better than I, about that, the, you know, these mega cities and mega slums and, and just the curse of urbanization. 
where does the bottleneck yeah. to breakthrough, where do those fellows lie? They, they seem to be in full support of it. And where do you fall in on, on, that, sure. uh, on, that, on that contradiction? Yeah, I, I think they are full support of it. I think they see urbanization as one of the, the keys to this. And, and the, their reasons would be that an urbanized, a deeply urbanized society, yes, it's going to go through, again, that development process where you're going to have large-scale slums, um, where you're going to have deep poverty and suffering. Uh, but then, if, you know, again, this is what they're arguing. <laughs> again, like it would go through a transition phase where, you know, the, 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 the system would get better, the infrastructure would get better, there would be a, a rise in uh, uh, basically better living standards. Um, and that they, they argue that within urban societies, you know, you can, you can, they argue that there's more efficiency in energy and resources and all that can be used much more efficiently, much more efficiently than sort of, and then, but I think the big argument as far as like mass extinction goes is that, you know, you have people exiting the rural areas is that you do see, at least in some places, then, a, a, you know, forests coming back, other things coming back, wildlife coming back, you know, that can happen. Uh, it all depends on the policies. Now, I think there is, you know, there is, I think, an argument to be made that cities don't actually, haven't actually delivered sort of on this energy efficiency yet. Um, and whether or not they will, I think there's an argument to be made that like cities maybe don't produce, uh, you know, they produce children that are disconnected from the environment. What is that going to mean in the future? I, you know, uh, there's a lot of arguments to be made, I think, against that viewpoint. But that is certainly one of the things that they are arguing is that cities are a key um, and that sort of these large mega cities are key and that then it will leave more and more uh, nature outside of the cities. Of course, then you also have the question of, OK, if you have rising middle classes and rising incomes, then you have rising consumption. And where does that consumption from come from? Nature. You know, so there's all those intersections that I think are, are a healthy place to debate. And I don't I think the answer is complicated. Like, I'm not I'm not saying I don't think cities are going to be the the answer to all of this. I think it's always complicated. I mean, one of the things you learn as a journalist writing this stuff day in and day out, week in, week out, year in, year out, is that it's complicated. It's never an easy black and white solution. Uh, things are never, I mean, I've been on the ground in these places where, you know, deforestation is happening, where wildlife is being poached to non-existence, you know, but it, it's never just a simple story. It's always complicated. Yeah. Um, so I think my brain tends to, to sort of have to embrace the messiness and the context. And again, maybe that also feeds into me having a little more hope because messiness and context and complications means that there's more space for that. I don't know. But, um, yeah. That's that's kind of their urbanization argument. Yeah, it's well, and like so many things, as you were just saying, when you try to see both sides of an argument, it's uh, you you almost freeze up. Like it, sure. when both sides of an argument make good sense, and then you get conflicted. Well, what which side do I take here? But I. It, just up here in upstate New York and New England, you can you can really see that literally the forest, you know, coming back. This is, I mean, there's yeah. no clear, I mean, there's these stone walls. Or right in the place I'm living, where I'm at now, the, all of these stone walls that are just running all through these forests. Just, a, you know, yeah. you think it looks like primeval forest, but you look at these stone walls and you say, you know, a hundred years ago, there was, uh, you know, there was a farm here and a, and a town. And it's so anyway, you can certainly see the yeah. argument of what they're talking about. OK, well, I, 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 I want to press on and to get a little more. L little more deeper in, into the mind of, I, I, I hope you don't mind me so, so, somewhat. No. I, and, and good nature, very good nature, uh, calling you an apocaloptimist. Uh, uh, <laughs> now, Jeremy Hans, I, I I don't know if the camera run, it was, I can't remember at what point I turned the camera on, that, that you... If, 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 if I had to choose the, probably the environmental journalist over the past uh, seven or eight years since I went down what I call the Doomer rabbit hole, if I had to choose 
the the person that has probably done as much or more to turn me into an absolutely hopeless uh, doomer. Oh my God! I'm so sorry. You would be you. you would be right up there. You, you more than any other Jeez. person on this planet, Jeremy Hans might have turned Sam Mitchell in, into a doomer. And every week, I mean, well, what's Jeremy going to say to depress me today? You've done a very oh, good okay. job of turning me in, into a in, okay. into a hopeless doomer, but apparently you haven't turned yourself into one. And I'm just and I. Honestly, in trying, and, and, and I'm not alone here, I know people yeah. listening are honestly trying to wrap our minds around how someone whose entire life is devoted to chronicling, what I call chronicling the collapse of a planet, chronicling the environmental news on this planet in the 21st century, Every day, every day, the, the news is worse than we saw. Uh -huh. it, it's happening faster than previously expected. Uh, Earth Overshoot Day is, uh, is showing up earlier and earlier every year. The United Nations is falling all over itself to which report can be more dire than the report before it. How do you... How do you see any any ray of hope through uh, this mounting tsunami of, of bad environmental news unfolding in the 21st century? Sure. Uh, there are so many. This is such a complicated answer. Uh, there are so many facets to this that I could probably look at like a psychologist trying to inspect myself. Um, so, yeah, part of it. You know, I, I think you could probably make an argument that maybe I'm delusional uh, and that that's a survival mechanism that I have to have in order to do this job. I mean, that's that's I think that that, you know, you can make that argument if people want to make that argument and that makes them feel better. Fine. Um, I'm fine with that. Uh, it's, it's not impossible. Um, but there are also other other facets to this. Uh, I, I think, you know, if, if humans anything, we are we are. And, and so let me start first with the with the term. Well, uh, finish that sentence. If humans optimism. are anything, we are fill in the blank. You didn't fill we in the blank. Optimists. We're what? No, no, yeah, we are. We are optimists. We we tend to be probably more hopeful than we should be. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we walk into things and then somehow sometimes it turns out okay. Uh, that thought, I'll finish that thought because that's an important thought. Okay. Um, but the the term the, the you know the, the definition of apocaloptimist you know uh, I, I personally I, I'm not really a fan of like labels like this or doom and gloom or you know because again when you write this stuff when you live this stuff it starts to become too complicated too contextualized uh, too at times even contradictory to like really put an easy stamp on it and I oh, know yeah. that humans again we we have this desire to label ourselves or to put ourselves in groups and that makes sense because that's how we make sense of the world. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself an apocaloptimist. I, would, I guess I'd say that, like, on the one hand, I have to have hope to survive. On the other hand, uh, I have seen, when I've traveled uh, just in my daily life, I have seen resilience in nature. So I, I think one of the questions is, when we talk about the collapse of whatever, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the collapse of the entire earth and everything goes extinct? Are we talking about humans going extinct? Are we talking about just the collapse of society? You know, what exactly, we have to kind of def make a definition as to what we're talking about in order to, to sort of define what we think is going to happen. Um, but I, I will say, I think that all the doom and gloom, all the depressing narratives, and I obviously, I've contributed this to you in your own life. Obviously, this is, this is, on the one hand, it's very important for people to understand the seriousness of this, but I also have come to believe that, like, if that's all we give people, then nothing is going to change, and what's the freaking point anyway? Um, we have to give people some kind of sliver of reason to hope, or people tend to just shut it out, and they go back to playing their video games or to doing whatever, and, you know, and they ignore all of this. And I think this is part of the environmental movement's sort of our difficulty in communicating with people is that we don't show where there is hope. Now, I have written about hopeful stories. I've I've seen the resilience of nature. You know, you look at the situation of bison in the U.S. You look at the situation of European bison in Europe. You look at the situation of 
uh, you know, white rhino that almost went extinct in Africa, and now there's 20,000 of them. Yeah, they're being poached to no end, but they're still there. Um, nature is freaking resilient. Uh, a lot, we can batter it to no end, and it will, you know, look at a lawn that hasn't been mowed. It will come back. Um, the question, I think, maybe, and this is maybe for you to define a little bit, is like, what exactly are we talking about? Uh, could civilization as we know it collapse? Yeah, probably. Um, you know, what is that going to look like? I think there's a lot of analogs we could look to, but like, that doesn't necessarily mean that I think the whole, you know, I don't think we're going to extinguish life on Earth even if we tried. Maybe nuclear holocaust would do it, but, you know, life is going to adapt, life is going to move on. Um, so, yeah, I think part of the question is exactly what we're defining about optimism and hopefulness and doom and collapse. Um, but there is this inbuilt resilience, I think, that uh, I have seen that gives me at least a sliver of hope. And when I say a sliver, I'm not talking like I'm, you know, 80 percent believe that this is all going to be fine. No way. You know, it's <laughs> I don't think this is all going to be fine. This is not going to be fine. Um, this is going to be really freaking hard. And this is going to really be probably, unfortunately, because we've waited so long, a lot of suffering and despair. Um, but will the whole civilization collapse? I just don't know. And what would that even look like? And what would that mean? You know? Yeah. Is, is that at all helpful? That might've been just very incoherent, but uh, it's a difficult subject to talk about. No, I, I mean, but, but, it, but it's, it's, I, I don't know if it's going to be enough to change any doomers arguments. People think I am joking when, when I say this, Jeremy, I, I want to get your, your spit on this. When I go around this planet looking for one ray of hope, there is one ray of hope uh, that I find on planet Earth. This is not a joke. I don't know why people think I'm kidding when I say this. It would be Chernobyl. That uh, what I sure. see going on no, in Chernobyl I, is, you know, I see the greatest Garden of Eden in, in uh, on the whole continent of Europe simply because Chernobyl has been declared a human exclusion zone. And when you just get humans out of the picture, uh, it's amazing yeah. about the resilience of nature. Where do you, do, yeah. do you see what I'm talking about? Oh, I, I totally 100% agree. And also, Chernobyl is a place where the radiation levels are still incredibly high. <laughs> you know, and there's still wildlife like crazy there because there aren't any humans. And this is where you get to something like um, Half Earth. You know, the idea that E.O. Wilson, who's one of my personal heroes, has put forward of the idea of setting aside half the planet for nature. Um, that is exciting. That is hopeful. That is a big idea. That's the kind of thing that I feel like in many ways we, we've been lacking in the environmental movement is that we need... We need big, massive, exciting, hopeful change. Otherwise, the youth of today, they're, they're going to be turned off. They're going to fall into despair. They're going to, you know, do things that just, that are not going to, you have to give people some kind of reason to get up in the morning um, or, or literally they're just going to stop listening. And, and I mean, honestly, I think most of my journalism has been people just, a lot of people just ignore it uh, because it's so it's pretty bleak and I, but I'm not going to sugarcoat stuff. I feel like I don't sugarcoat stuff. Um, but you know, I, I have like Chernobyl is a great example. Uh, whaling is a great example, right? You know, uh, I think whaling is one of the best examples we have of environmental recovery. You know, we stopped whaling in the seventies and eighties and all of a sudden now we have now some species are not doing well, totally agree with that, but humpback whales are everywhere. And they're almost back to pre-whaling numbers. And now that they're just is getting amazing. wrapped up in uh, fish line and, and getting hit by cargo ships, you know. It's a, <laughs> sure, but they're there. <laughs> they are. They're, at least there's some to get hit numbers. by cargo ships. Um, again. It's the same thing with, with white. With what? You know, white white rhinos, right? Almost White rhinos. I, I, just, I was just reading uh, something were about the to... last two white rhinos. One of the subspecies, aren't they trying to? Aren't, aren't they down to like two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The northern white rhinos. Yeah, they're trying everything they can. But I'm talking about the southern the white. Southern rhino. white rhino. You okay. know, uh, yeah. People thought it had gone extinct. They found it in a marshy swamp where it was hiding out for probably a good decade from hunters. This is in the you know early 1900s, I think. Um, they found a one population left of, I don't remember, maybe 
exactly. I don't remember the exact numbers. I think it was a few dozen, maybe a hundred. Um, and now we have 20,000, you know, and are they getting poached? Yeah, they're getting hammered, but they're still there and there's still 20,000 of them. They're being protected by some of the most brave, dedicated people on the planet. You know, it, one of the things that you see when you write about this stuff is you meet these conservationists who have literally devoted their entire life to a single species, you know, to, to saving one species or one place. And that gives me hope. Um, that is an amazing, that's something that I don't think personally I could do. I'd probably get bored after three days. Um, you know, but they have devoted their life to bringing back one thing or protecting one place and damn it to hell, they're going to do it. So, uh, you know, that is one of those things where you get these, when you write about these stories, you get these, 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 just these moments of, of, of what you can see what's possible. If we made better decisions as humans, if we, if we elected better leaders, um, you can kind of see this glimmer of what, what world we could, we could create. Um, but I think, you know, obviously, you know, looming over all of this is the climate catastrophe. And I think there's really no way to sugarcoat that. That is going to be absolutely horrific and awful. Um, and I think the question for me is how quickly is society going to be able to wake up and how quickly are we going to be able to sort of act and potentially, you know, uh, do some major things that we need to do in order to mitigate the damage. But, you know, uh, that's still, I think, in some ways an open question. And now I think some people believe that it's, it's doomed and there's no there's nothing we can do and we're all doomed. And, you know, I don't think that's an illegitimate idea. I think that that's, you know, you can make that argument. Sure. Um, I don't really know where we go after we've made that argument. If that's if that's what you believe, then what do you do? You know, <laughs> like, what's the point? You get out there um, and enjoy well, it uh, while you still can, and, and and embrace every beautiful day on the planet, like the one here in the Catskill Mountains. It, it, any, anyway, uh, Jeremy Hans, yeah. I I am having a great time with this, but the global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse here in three and a half minutes. So. As well, I, let me do. Ask, I, have, I have like one question for you, though. When you say collapse, can you define it for me what you mean? Good Lord, you'll have to interview. Well, the, the, you'll have to interview me for your uh, sometime. Uh, anyway, I, I, would, I, I would spend an hour on that, but we're going to we have to wrap okay. this wrap this up with you, brother. So Fair if enough. you had if you were not talking to me on Collapse Chronicles for an hour, but you had one minute uh, you had 60 seconds with the mainstream media with a camera in your face saying, Jeremy Hance, you have 60 seconds to send out the Jeremy Hance message to the world in, the, in 2019. What would that sound bite sound like to wrap up this conversation? Uh, that is a great question. I think, I mean, the thing is, is I feel like it went... <laughs> Uh, I would say if we don't deal with climate catastrophe, nothing else is going to matter. Uh, and if you love your kids, you better start getting on board with that. Okay, well, that was, the, you know, that whole part of the conversation, uh, we, we didn't even get into the whole climate thing. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that opens up the, the, the whole new... New part now, Jeremy. I want you to hang on for uh, uh, for just a sure. a minute after we after we wrap up here. But guys, if you want to hear more from Jeremy, JeremyHance.com is excellent website, and you can always find him in Manga Bay and frequently over there in the Guardian. And, and I just real quickly, guys, I, I, I'm just asking you nicely. <coughs> To, to be nice here. I, I know that some of you are biting at the bit, and if this just turns into a, a free-for-all of nasty comments, I will delete the, and, and just shut down comments. So we really want to thank Jeremy for uh, taking the time and having the courage to have this conversation on Collapse Chronicles. And Jeremy Hance, we really appreciate you coming here and talking to us, and more importantly, we appreciate the hard work you are doing to bring us the message and keep up the good fight. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the time to talk about these super important issues. Okay. Bye, guys.